This episode of Where Did the Road Go is brought to you in part by our Patreons. If you want to become a patron, go to wheredidtheroadgo.com. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. All right. Welcome to the show. This is another repost. This show initially aired on uh, September 5th and September 12th of 2015 with David Politis. It's one of the most popular interviews, but a lot of people only listen to the first part for some reason. So I put these two together. Again, this is a repost. It is not a new interview. It's just here so you can listen to it in one part and so that people actually listen to both parts. I will be doing this with other shows as I get time, other two-part shows that have been popular over the years, as well as, of course, new stuff every week. So here you go, David Politis, A Sobering Coincidence from 2015. All right, David, welcome back to the show. Well, thanks a million, Soraya. It's always great to be here. And uh, last time I had you on, we were talking about your documentary, and you definitely got that funded. Well, it was thanks to you and uh, all the supporters out there who pitched in, and we were very fortunate to get uh, well above our minimum target, and uh, we're very, very grateful for the support. Do you, do you have a timetable on when you're going to be uh, putting that out by any chance? Well, we're, we're targeting late spring and summer to do film festivals. And according to their rules, we can't release anything before we submit to a film festival. Right. So we've got to wait. And my guess is it'll probably be somewhere around you know 10 to 12 months before you actually see anything about what we've done. But you're going to be able to do a little more than you planned, though, aren't you? Oh, I, we've already been talking about doing uh, some on-screen animation work that we weren't going to be able to do before, so this is good. Awesome. All right, and then right on top of that, you have released a brand new book. Yeah, I, I promised people on Facebook there were going to be a series of announcements over the next several months, and this is the next one, and it has to do with Missing 411. We We stay on the same theme, but... As I say, there's another spoke in the wheel. Yeah, you call this one a sobering co- coincidence. Yep. And you're you go in a very different direction here as you're looking at more urban areas, but you're still looking for specific patterns. And if anyone doesn't get that, you're not just following random missing people and and reporting on them. You're looking for very specific patterns, very certain, very certain things in these cases that replicate in other cases. It's not just a matter of someone going missing. So we call them profile points. And it is exactly, uh, some people have said, oh, you know, Politis is just cherry picking reports and looking for specific elements. That's exactly what we're doing. Right. We are looking for patterns within missing people cases. And if those elements that exist show themselves in a case, we're interested. And as an example, one of them is they bring a canine out and the canine can't find any scent of where the victim went. That's one of the profile points that continues to show up. And I don't care what kind of missing person case it is, at this point we're going to be looking at it if that exists. Okay, and um, why did you turn toward these more urban accounts? Well, I've got to give some credit to George Knapp. Uh, I was doing a show with him a couple years ago and he said, you know, I think you're going to find your way to the city one of these days. And he goes, I realize that's going to be a tougher tougher case to make without people being able to say, oh, this happened or that happened like you can in the woods. But he goes, I just think you're headed that way. And it, those kind of people need to say something every once in a while for us to keep our eyes wide open and not get tunnel vision on what we're doing. And it did. It forced us to keep our eyes open and look at a broader spectrum I was reading an article one day about a college kid who disappeared. They bring canines in, the canines walk in circles, and they can't find the scent. And right away, I started paying attention. And then other elements of what we've identified were showing up, and we said, you know, maybe there's something to these college kids that are disappearing. And I'd written about college-age students who had disappeared on campuses in the past under strange circumstances. 
But this was a little different in that the 100 plus cases in this book are almost cookie cutters of each other. Yeah. Yeah. And some of this has been covered under the under the title the smiley face murders correct and that's a series of detectives uh, kevin gannon from new york city a retired uh, homicide detective and missing persons investigator early in his career he came across a missing persons case and dan the guy was sharp he where a lot of missing persons detectives would find a body in the water write the report go home and forget it gannon actually spent a lot of time analyzing where the body was found, how it was found, the distance it was found, why it wasn't wearing certain clothing, and he put his mind to it, and he uncovered some things that were monumental. Now, the smiling face part of it, I don't buy into that part of it, but what Gannon did in proving through forensics that those bodies weren't in the water as long as people said was sort of our entry point. Namely, that the bodies are found without clothing or without shoes, which matches what we've been doing. Canines can't track the body from, or the person from where they were last seen to the water. Sometimes there's no relationship, and there's no tracks, there's nothing between where they disappeared and the water, and there had to have been in, in logical terms. And then when we expand that out and we say, okay, if our profile points fit what they're doing, then it should follow that this is happening in other countries. And we followed the path, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, we have cases in Spain, in the UK, and that fit exactly with what we're talking about that's happening here in the United States and Canada. And in the same way it happened in the missing 411 books before, it's happening exactly here. Now, where, where did the smiley face thing come from? Was it, wasn't there like a smiley face near where some of the bodies were found or something like that? That's what they said, yeah. Okay. I, I knew people were starting to move away from that idea and realizing it was probably just a coincidence. Yeah, probably. Um, what you have, though, is uh, and, and although most of these are very cookie cutter, there are some that kind of stand out a little bit, uh, but the main points are still there. I, and uh, go on. I, I think that's that I'm glad you were able to see that by reading it because it has to be evident to the reader that this all is one consistent uh, criminal occurrence that's been happening for years. Now, in our first, first three or four books, it kind of looked like a lot of things could be happening. Now, when yeah. you put the forensics to these cases, there can be no doubt that a crime's occurring. When a person disappears on one date, they find their body in the river 50 days later, and the coroner and the medical examiners come back and say, well, yeah, but the body wasn't in the river all those times for all those days. Yeah. The, and, and I still think that there could be multiple explanations for what you're seeing, but there is definitely um, a sort of a malicious pattern there as well. There is, a, there, there is something, in a sense, uh, victimizing these people. I don't think there's any doubt now. Uh, in the earlier books, you could go a couple of different ways, but yeah, with the, with this book, it's it's hard to get away from that. And when in the earlier books, when I said that bodies were found in areas previously searched, that continues on here. It, yeah. In this incident, in this instance, what's happened is is that the water has given us evidence that land couldn't give us. The water does certain things to the body at an exact pace that can't be misinterpreted. Whereas on land, there's a lot of variables, humidity, rain, snow, animal predation, et cetera, et cetera. In the water, there's an exact science that's known about how fast a, a body will deteriorate, uh, skin maceration, loss of hair. All these things happen at a certain time frame, and you know exactly how long the body's been in. Well... Uh, one of the male college students disappears on January 1st, he's found 50 days later, and he still has rigor mortis in his body, you know that that person hasn't been dead for more than a couple days. It's just fact. Right. And uh, also the, the, the element, uh, or what's it called, the date rape drug being found in some of these cases. GHB. Yeah, and that is not something you find in high levels in the body naturally. Correct. In low levels, you do. In high levels, you don't. What's interesting is that uh, there's a, 
there's a toxic, toxicological screening that the, the bodies go through at the coroner's office. GHB is not one of those standard screening drugs that they're looking for. And the fascinating part of that is what GHB does to the body when you take it is it makes you almost paralyzed, but you're awake and you know what's happening. So if you, somebody gave you GHB or you somehow ingested GHB, say there's some kind of aerosol way to deliver it, and you get put in a river, you're not going to be able to fight back. You're going to drown. And in all of these cases, or in a vast majority of them, drowning is a possibility in how they died. And the coroners don't test for GHB. Son of a gun. Some of, some of them realized something was really going on, and they started to test, and they started to find it. Now, the million-dollar question is, how did these people get GHB into their system at such high levels when in reality they were around friends and things, and then boom, they're gone. Who knows how they got it? Yeah, and we'll get into some of uh, some of the cases here uh, where you can kind of tell that somebody just disappeared. Right. But we'll we'll get onto those in a little bit later. Why don't we go through? Uh, you have a section here on key cases, and these are these are good solid examples of the pattern you're talking about. And uh, this first one comes from uh, north of where we are here in New York State in Canton. And uh, his name was Adam Falcon. Yeah, January 13th, 2004, about 1.38 in the morning, 20 years old, Adam Falcon. Uh, he went to St. Lawrence University to have about 2,500 students. The big majors there, economics and biology. He's a really popular kid. He played competitive soccer for St. Lawrence. And he taught soccer during the summer. He's described as like Mr. Personality, easy going, polite, loved kids. Well, it turns out that on the 12th of November, he got hurt at practice and he couldn't play. And uh, he didn't play. But on the night of the 12th, he had two bowls of spaghetti before he attended a St. Lawrence hockey game in town. And uh, at about 9.15, the game was over. He left with some friends, and they went to a party at a place called the Don Eaton Dormitory on campus. He hung around there for about 45 minutes, and then uh, he and some buddies went to a local coffee house to listen to some music. They left at about 11. At 11.30, his card access at the university showed him returning to that dorm party. At 12.30 a.m. on November 13th, just a couple hours or an hour later, he leaves that dorm, and he went to downtown Canton to a place called the TikTok Bar on Hodgkin's, Hodgkin Street, just off of Main Street. And at 1.38, witnesses put him going out the back door of the bar, and he's never seen again alive. And what happened was, is the next day they had a soccer game, and he had responsibilities even though he was injured, and he didn't report to the game. Nobody saw him. At 10 p.m. that night, they reported him as a missing person. This is one of those things in Canton at the time, the whole town pitched in, and I mean all the sports teams, helicopters came in, planes, the soccer team and other athletic teams participated in the search, forest rangers, volunteers, and the New York State dive team came in and spent their time in the river looking for any evidence of anybody in the river. On the 18th, uh, an article stated that 30 divers searched the river in town, and the dive master made a special statement that by going into the river, it eliminates any possibility that Adam's in the water. So they eliminated that. Now, they later, uh, just four or five hours later after that statement came out, some police officers in town were searching an area almost in the middle of town, and they found Adam's baseball cap and his cell phone in an opposite direction of the river from the bar, sitting on a, on a pile of leaves. Now what's fascinating about this is that the report stated that there was none of his scent found on the cell phone or the baseball cap. And on a baseball cap, you should have really heavy scent. And it was found between three, uh, two buildings behind a fence line on a pile of leaves. And I, I say in the book, I commend the police officers in finding this because it was in a place you would never, ever think to look. It was almost like uh, it could have been dropped in or thrown over the way it landed. 
So on November 19th, almost at the end of the day, 4.55 p.m., behind the Knights of Columbus Hall, in a seven-foot deep hole, searchers are prodding around, and they find Adam's body. Now, he had no pants, he had his boxers on, and he had his shoes on. And the police couldn't explain how his pants were off and his shoes were on and his boxers were on. And his pants were later found 80 feet downstream. And the witnesses said that they were sure searchers had searched that hole many times in the previous days and found nothing. And this is a real slow-moving river, two to three miles per hour, no acceleration to it at all. Canines that were searching the city for Adam never went anywhere near the water. So they're stumped. Now, five, on the 13th at 138, you, you fast forward five days later, and Adams pulled out of the river. And the coroner stated that he had rigor mortis that was identifiable. And that sh he should have been out of rigor mortis being gone for five days. Because rigor mortis enters, that's the stiffening of the muscles, and that enters the body two to four hours after death, and it leaves the body at 24 to 36 hours after death. So there is no way Adam should have had any rigor mortis in his system if he died the night or the early morning that he disappeared. And the coroner stated that the rigor mortis was moderate, meaning that he wasn't going into it or coming out of it. He was in the middle of it, which, mean, which meant that he had to have died sometime on the 16th, three days after he disappeared on the 13th. Now, lividity is the settling of blood in your body after death. So if you're laying on your back, the blood would settle in your buttocks and in your shoulders, and it starts 30 minutes after you die, and it stays in a fixed position 12 hours after you die. Now, the coroner stated that on Adam's body, the lividity was found in several different locations, which is puzzling. Some people call it the washing machine effect, that if you're in a river and you're getting tossed over and over and over again, that you could have this effect. But the river moved so slowly that that didn't make sense. And the, the real, real most puzzling thing is, is that Adam's body was supposedly, everyone believed initially, in that river for five days. So decomposition should have been happening, and it should have been fairly well advanced at this point. Yet his body was so pristine, they had an open casket at the funeral. Now, Kevin Gannon and his partner Gilbertson, who is a professor, believe Adam was taken, held for three days, and dumped in the river to die. Now, the coroner ruled that it was accidental driving, drowning with hypothermia. Adam's father said in an interview that when he went in to get the answers about what happened to his son, he was insulted by the lack of facts and the way he was treated. It was almost as though they were treating him like he was stupid and they couldn't really explain what happened. And then another coroner stated that he believed Adam had to have been unconscious when he entered the river. Two other medical examiners reviewed the coroner's findings who initially did it. One coroner stated that Adam didn't even drown. And another said that the cause of death was inconclusive. Now, if I, if I presented this case to you or a group of students, everyone would say, well, yeah, that's pretty interesting. That's pretty weird. But, you know, a lot of weird things happen in life, and maybe this did. But after you read the facts of this case, and I present to you other cases that have almost identical facts, how can this be happening? Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. That the, if it was just one case... Okay, that would that would be in a way dismissible because you didn't see it replicated anywhere. And maybe someone got something wrong or something very weird happened in that one case. But when you're seeing it repeat over and over, it's uh, either it's it's either saying we don't understand or it's deliberate. Yeah, and I don't see because because these things about your body are so cut and dry. I don't see how there are many other explanations other than, especially when you look at the, the bulk of these cases on the whole, 
these young men were not dead the night that they went missing. They weren't in the right. water the night they went missing. And when you, if you read my previous books, how did Adam Falcon's pants come off and his shoes yeah. were on? Yeah, that, that, yeah. <laughs> it just, so every aspect of this, you know, where his stuff was found, everything was just bizarre. Now, in a lot of these cases, the people who disappear were last seen drunk. And when they're found, they still have a high alcohol content in their body. But like in this case, you know, where he had only died recently, shouldn't the alcohol have gotten out of their systems before the point they were found? You would think that would be the case. But there's, a, there's another case in, in the books where uh, a guy was leaving the bar and he stopped by two police officers. And he's underage. And the police officers interview him, and he's not drunk. Two guys interview him. And they end up issuing a series of citations for being underage in a bar and this and that. He had been drinking, but he wasn't intoxicated. So he disappears under similar circumstances to Adams. And he's found days, days later. And he, there's no way he could have been in the river for the entire time either. Yet his blood alcohol level was through the roof. And the police officers even said, we are baffled by how he got the alcohol in his system because the town was shut down at the time and the bars were closed when he left. And where the police officers released him versus where he supposedly went in the river and where he was supposedly found, it almost indicated that he left the police officers, disappeared, showed up days later in a river downstream in a place he shouldn't have been. So it, it's almost as though these people are somehow getting the alcohol into their system or getting the drugs into their system in some way we don't understand. Or someone is making sure it's there before they die in order to cover up what's really going on. Exactly. Because they know people will say, well, he was drunk and wandered into the river. You know, another individual used this term, and I'm going to use it every time I'm in an interview. It's called plausible deniability. And... In all of the cases that I present, it's easily to go to that place in your mind and say, well, you know, it's plausible that this happened or that happened. Or like you said, in these cases, ah, oh, they were drunk and they're just stupid kids and they fell in the water. And, you know, that's the safe place in your mind to go. Or in the other books, you know, they were hikers and they made a bad decision and they walked into infinity and they fell off a cliff and they died. Right. So that's a plausible deniability factor and if you don't invest in truly understanding what's happening here, that's where you're going to go. Sure. It's, it's the easy out. Exactly. Um, another key case you had in there, and I'm going to say the kid's name, last name wrong, but it's Ta Todd Geib or Geib? I think it's Geib. Geib. Okay. And this one has, a, has the has another element into it, which you have in a few of these cases, which is he was on the cell phone when he disappeared. And there's, there's a few cases like that I have in the book that are pretty scary with the, the consequences. And, and I mean, there's, there's a handful where the people were on the phone with somebody, and it's almost as though they saw something or something happened to them, they get a few words out, and boom, they're gone. Yeah. Now, in Todd's case, June 11th, 05, 1 a.m., Casanova, Michigan, it's about 25 miles north of Grand Rapids, and this area is an established cluster, geographical cluster area that we have on our map for missing people, kind of the area of Weber and Ludington, Michigan. But Guy knew Casanova like the back of his hand. He was an outdoorsman, trophy fisherman, deer hunting, played basketball, baseball in school. He was described as having a very dry sense of humor, a strongly religious ties, Protestant and Catholic, and the only vice people said he really had was smoking. Now, I, I'll say this, that there's, there seems to be a tie-in between German people and these disappearances. And I don't understand it, and I'm not saying it's an overwhelming tie-in at this point, but it's, it, there seems to be something there. And uh, Todd had strong family ties as well, and his parents lived five miles away in Ravenna, 
On June 11th, 05, at about 6 to 6.30, he was at his parents' house. He had some dinner, and he left, and he went back home, and he, he lived with his cousin. They spoke briefly, and then they drove at 7.30 to a local bar, met some friends for drinks. At 9.30, Todd left the bar, walked on foot to a local party, an annual party that's held in this orchard. A couple kegs, bonfire, 50 people. It's just a fun thing to do in the middle of, of a field. And at about 12 a.m., Todd told people he was tired and he was going to walk to his house. And I'll stop you there. When you read the book, you're going you're gonna to see that the people that disappear either are going to say they don't feel good or they're tired and they separate themselves from people uh, in many of these incidents. And Todd did. Todd, for some reason, said he was tired and was leaving. Well, he knew this area like the back of his hand. He, he just, he spent so much time here. On his way from there, that location to his house, he made four phone calls between 12.45 and 1 a.m. At 12.47, he called a friend and said he was in a field and the call dropped. Friend called back and he thought he heard heavy breathing or wind. Another saw call said he was having trouble breathing and was in a field and it dropped. Now, what's interesting is that in my other books, just north of this location, uh, I wrote a story about a guy named Colin Finnerty who was an NFL football player. And he was fishing. And during that time he was fishing, he called his wife, heavy breathing, said that he thought he was being followed by some big guys, and he was scared, and they ended up finding him dead in a field. Now, Todd, what's fascinating is that right after I did a coast-to-coast interview, and I explained that there's a couple of these cases where there's heavy breathing and wind, somebody said, well, what happens if he was pulled up fast up into the air? And that wind was the wind in the phone because of the acceleration going up into the sky. Huh. Kind of an interesting angle when you consider that they bring in canines and they don't pick up any scent. Yeah. Well, so he disappears and almost immediately a search starts because he was supposed to be at a family event the next day. And there were some rumors that there was some altercation between Todd and some other people. That was false. On June 13th, 100 searchers comb the area. Uh, canines are brought in helicopters. No scent is is found by the canines. All the swamps, lakes in the area were searched. Uh, his residence was on the west side of Half Moon Lake, east side of Highway 37, and the party was on the west side of the road. Now, they continue to search, and there's a small body of water on the west side of the highway called Ovid Hall Lake about a thousand feet long and it's narrow there's no road that goes to it it's not easily accept, uh, accessible but some locals do fish it now people did fish the lake on May 17th through the 18th and they were using using fish finders and rate and underwater radar to, to look at the bottom of the water and scan the bottom and they didn't they went through the whole le- lake the witnesses said and saw nothing now July 2nd at 5 p.m long after Todd disappeared, a husband and wife are walking along the lake and they're walking down to it and they see something really odd in the water. They describe it as protruding from the water. They go down and it's Todd's body. And the witness told the police it was floating like a bobber. Now, Todd's hat, his cell phone, and one shoe were missing. And he had been missing for 21 days. Now, once you know, understand the forensics of a body, men die and they always, always, always float face down in the water based on our body composition. Women tend to float face up. Todd's sticking up out of the water, floating like a bobber, which makes no sense at all and there are any conditions. Now, people said that the location had been searched many times. He was found in the opposite direction If he was traveling from the party to his house, he was on the opposite side of the party, way in the opposite direction, Uh, and in a location that had a low probability that he would have been, but they searched it anyhow. 
Now, when the on-scene coroner gets there and pulls the body out, he writes down in his paperwork as the circumstances are suspicious. So right away, they're not thinking that this is a drowning. Now, there's no rigor in the body. There's no ice in the lake to force the body up. They couldn't determine any lividity in the body, which makes absolutely no sense because it's in a pond or small lake with no current. They said decomposition was intermediate to moderate. He had hair in his head. He had swelling around his eyelids. They couldn't determine the color of the iris. But the body for being in the water for 21 days was described as pristine. Doesn't make sense. His blood alcohol level was determined to be 0.12. Long time ago, the blood alcohol level for driving under the influence of most states was 0.10, so he wasn't stumbling drunk. Toxicology tests determined that there was something called continine, which is a byproduct of smoking. And he had some drugs in his system that were depression-oriented drugs. And Todd never took any drugs, and he wasn't under any depressed state. And they couldn't determine, no one could determine how these got in his system. Now, how he died, or how in the circumstances he got in the water, were listed by the coroner as undetermined, but they thought he drowned. But there was no water found in his lungs. So, right there, there's some unusual parts to this story, but they bring in a secondary autopsy from a famous doctor named Cyril Wecht. He determined that, Tom, that uh, Todd was dead or unconscious when he entered the water. He determined that photos of the body that were taken, I mean, they took photos of the body after he'd come out in an autopsy. They took it to a medical conference, and they showed it to the attendees, which were all medical examiners. And it was the unanimous opinion that the body had not been in the water 20-plus days. And they, it was the opinion that he was held somewhere for 15 to 18 days and then placed in the water. And the parents and everyone involved tried to get the Michigan State Police who had this case to change the cause of death from drowning to murder, and they wouldn't touch it. So, so with the phone call, I mean, that's really interesting. I hadn't really considered that the wind sound might be movement. Um, there are a couple other cases in this book, uh, one where the guy says, oh, uh, beep, and then just that was the, the last you heard of him. And another one where, if I remember right, the person was yelling for help as, uh, and sounding like they were being pulled away from the phone. Right. Uh, there's a case in Minnesota where the guy's walking away, he's talking to a girl, and the girl says, what's going on? And he says, oh my God, where are you? And then the phone goes dead. Another time, there's a case where uh, a guy's at a Boston Bruins game. He's talking to his girlfriend on the phone. He goes, you know, I think my phone's going to go dead. She's around the corner, turns the corner. The phone's dead. She can't see, and he was supposed to be right there. He's not there. He's found days later in a river nearby, and his phone is found smashed into a million pieces nearby. Right, and that's one of the cases I wanted to talk about, too, because of that. Yeah, it's... Uh, there, the phone going dead, the people separated from the phone, seems to be a common occurrence. And one of the other things that seems to be a common occurrence is that so many of the people are found in the opposite direction that they were last seen going. Pretty unusual, uh, especially in a case like Todd's, where the guy knew the area by the back of his hand, and to end up so convoluted in the water makes zero sense. Yeah. Um, and of course, one of the, the other common things is that people are found in areas that are previously searched, which is something that is extremely common in your previous books as well out in the national parks. And you know, I say this all the time, and it's probably a good time to say it again. This isn't implying that the search people missed the body or they did a bad job and they, and they weren't conscientious. I think all the evidence points to when you get the number of cases that I've accounted for where this has happened, it, it points in those cases that the people probably weren't there. Now, when you're talking about water cases, we can prove the people weren't there. Right, right, because you have the, the forensic evidence behind it. Correct. Um, 
So let's look at the case of Joseph Grunzel, and uh, this was someone who was actually in the military. Yeah, and this is this is a Canada case, and it's around the Great Lakes. And I and I said in my last missing 411 book that we established a cluster zone that completely surrounds the Great Lakes. And this is one of those cases that happened right on a Great Lake in Canada. Uh, absolutely a straight arrow kid, 21 years old, October 22nd, 2003, Kingston, Ontario, Canada. He's at the Royal Canadian Military Academy. Canada only has one college-level military academy, and this is it. And the best of the best in Canada go there. It's far. It's at the far northeast end of Lake Ontario, 160 miles southwest of Montreal. And I mean, they have the brightest of the best there. Well, Grozel was one of them. On October 22nd, he was in his junior year, and he was just elected to the most prestigious position you could have in that year, and that was squadron leader. And it was a huge position for any cadet. He played on the academy's uh, basketball team. He was described as everybody, a smart, polite, mature, an absolute stellar individual. Now, I'll stop you there. And when I was a police officer, I came across in the middle of the night when I was on patrol, sometimes the credence of the world, the underprivileged, the alcoholics, the drug addicts, the people that would be sleeping in doorways, intoxicated, under the influence, etc. And when you take what I've described here in the books and you apply it to normal, everyday municipality, you would expect that some of these victims were of that level in society. The criminals, the drug addicts, the stone-cold alcoholics that made their way into this river system and drowned, or into a pond, or into a lake. And in writing all about this, there isn't one of those cases. Yeah. And in my books, I've described that there's both ends of that, that intellectual spectrum. There's, there's people that are just the brightest of the bright, the physicians, the physicists, the people that are in college that have disappeared. On that other end, you have people with brain disease, autism, dementia, that have also disappeared. But you would expect that some of these people would be of the lower level in society that fell in the river and drowned. But that's not what's happening here. The people I've described in the books, many times I wrote a story and at the end I had tears in my eyes because it reminded me of my own kids. And to think that these people ended up in a water makes no sense. And if you followed logic, it would say that a cross-section of society should end up in that position, not just right. the best of the best. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Well, on, this, on October 22, 2003, Joe's in his dorm room working on a school paper. His girlfriend, a, a long-term girlfriend, is in the room studying a law class. And at 1 a.m., she falls asleep. Joe's on the computer. She wakes up at 5.30 a.m. He's missing. His cell phone, watch, and wallet in the room. Now, there you go. Separation of person from cell phone. How many 21-year-old guys walk out of a room for a couple hours and don't take their wallet and their cell phone? Yeah. At 6 a.m., she leaves the room. He still hasn't seen Joe. And per periodically check the room during the day. At about 4.30 p.m., he had basketball practice, so she goes to practice, and he wasn't there. And she told the coach, hey, something's wrong. They file a missing persons report. So this happens on military property, and it belongs to the military, and they originally take over the search of the grounds, the water areas, the buildings, and they confiscated his computer and went through that, thinking that he's on the computer. Maybe he's communicating with somebody. He went out and met with some foul play. It didn't happen. And then they started to work with the Kingston, Ontario Police, the Provincial Police, and the National Investigative Service of the Military. And everybody is working to find this kid. Well, the Academy sits on the peninsula, peninsula of the Cataraki River at the west end of Lake Ontario, kind of where the river flows into the lake. On 
The 13th of November, almost three weeks later, his body's found in the river. And the coroners are unable to determine the cause of death. There are very few details released about his body. But uh, almost a year later, his body is, is exhumed, and they do a secondary autopsy. They confirm to the public there were no drugs or alcohol in the system, which isn't a surprise because he was a, just a standout straight arrow kid. Again, a secondary autopsy refers an undetermined cause of death. Grozel's parents were interviewed, and his parents said his death was neither an accident nor suicide. And I think those are revealing, and you've got to listen to that and think that through. Now, this is a weird set of circumstances, but 40 miles west of that academy is the Canadian Forces base called Trenton. And there was a colonel there named Russell Williams, who was the commander of the 8th Wing at the base, from August uh, of 03 to June of 04. There was some innuendo because the colonel was charged with murdering two people. And there was some innuendo that he may have been involved in Joe's murder and they didn't want anything involved in it. Well, an autopsy proved that there was nothing done to the body that would remotely be a homicide per se. Right. But Joe's body was in the river and it, the location it was found in after that number of days would indicate that his body would have had to have been dumped in the river miles and miles upstream to end up where it did when it was found. Now, the things to think about is that he left his cell phone behind. What pulled him from that room? Why did he leave when his girlfriend was there asleep? How many 21-year-olds go anywhere without their cell phone? One, one coroner stated that Joe's body was consistent with being in the water for one to two weeks. He was missing October 22nd, found November 13th, 21 days or three weeks missing. I think it's pretty evident that he wasn't in the water the whole time again. Based on where he was found in the river and the, based on his body composition and decomposition factors found at the time. Are are you familiar with uh, the disappearance of a trucker named Devin Williams? I don't think so. Okay. Um, it just this well, while we were talking, this it reminded me of this. Um, Steph Young, who I've had on the show a few times, also collects uh, strange disappearance stories. She's not doing them in a pattern whatsoever. She's just looking at different odd things that have happened. And Devin Williams uh, drove, he was a long distance trucker. He drove his truck into the National Forest area of Buck Springs. And that is in, uh, it doesn't say where it is. Well, anyway, uh, his truck eventually got stuck on a dirt road. He disembarked and walked away from the truck. Hikers nearby were witness to this odd erratic behavior. They asked him why he drove his truck there. And he pointed to the truck and said, I didn't, they did it. Uh, they told how he was barefoot and seemed disoriented as he talked to a tree. That was the last time anyone saw him, that he vanished without a trace. They found his bones uh, some time later, uh, but canines couldn't find a track or anything else. And it sounds very similar to the, the patterns that you're describing. And it, it just, it, it's almost like something is affecting these people. In such a way, like like it's it, it's not quite schizophrenic, but something is getting into their heads. Well, one of the things in the stories that I think can be said is at the time there's separation between people, the victim and their friends. The people aren't aware of that separation point. Yeah. Now, in Grozel's case, the girlfriend says she, she fell asleep. In other cases that I talk about in the book, the people are together in a bar, and one second their friends are there, and the next second they're gone, and nobody ever sees them leave. In other cases, there's closed-circuit television coverage of the entrances and exits, and there's no evidence that they did leave. And we'll talk about something like that later. But there, at that separation point, there is no witness, which is yeah. a strange fact. 
Well, even in the, in the other books, you have cases where, you know, the person last in line or first in line disappears when they're out of sight, even if they're only out of sight for a moment. Correct. So you're, you're again, getting that pattern. But it, there are numerous cases in all these books where it seems like somebody sees something or gets distracted by something. Or in this case of Joe here, you know, it's like he just suddenly got up and walked out of his room and disappeared. Now, in this case, somebody brought this up to me already and said, well, Dave, you know, a lot of times under the uh, work of John Mack, he talks about people in a bedroom and one person can be awake and they can't wake up the other person. Mm -hmm. And they claim that they're removed from the room somehow. Right. So... In that circumstances, if you read Max's work, that could have been the scenario here. We don't know. That's very true. That's very true. Um, of course, when you when you deal with alien abduction, you got to deal with the, the whole subjective objective issue. I mean, um, Rick Strassman was able to recreate some level of UFO abduction experiences while the person's laying there on DMT. So obviously that was a subjective experience, but, you know, people like Whitley Strieber have had, you know, guests over who all witnessed the same thing when these entities have appeared. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I just, people bring up odd things that seem to fit the scenarios under these certain circumstances. Oh, it could very well all be connected. It may not be the exact same thing, but it could all be connected somehow. It could, and, and I think, you know, the more I read your stuff, the more I feel like we're missing something. It's it's not just um, something that we already understand, that we just have to put the puzzle pieces together right. We don't have all the pieces. Well, you know, there's a lot of people out there that think that this is all just crap. That oh, Of course. And we, we've talked about this before, that if you haven't, if you don't have the background, you don't ha and you haven't, laid out that that map of how we got from point A to today where we are and maybe point P, if you don't understand that roadmap and how, to, how we got there, then it's hard to believe that there is something that ties all of this together. And it's, it's so vast in its numbers that you can't say it's mere coincidence. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and the fact that it's not, oh, how can I put this? It's not every missing person's case. No. Very specific types of people that, get, that have these scenarios happen to them. Correct. Um, let's move on to William Hurley. We mentioned this briefly with the cell phone earlier, but I thought this was uh, another case that, that shows you how quickly some of these people disappear. And, and it's lightning fast. Uh, another straight arrow guy, William Hurley, 24 years old. His buddies called him Will. October 8, 2009, in downtown Boston at 8.30 p.m. His nickname was Mr. Reliable, Never Late. Uh, he was raised in Nashville, North Carolina, joined the Navy out of high school. He was mostly stationed in Florida. The military group he was with went to Boston on a St. Patrick's Day, and it turns out when he was on leave, he, had, he met his girlfriend, kind of the love of his life, a girl named Claire Mahoney. And they lived together in Quincy, Mass., well, on October 8th, uh, Will woke up at 4.30, and he was a groundskeeper at the Weston Country Club and drove into work, and his buddy at the time, Brendan Venti, they were just both in best buddies, and Brendan invited William to go to the Country Club, I mean, I'm sorry, to go to the Bruins game that night and watch the Ducks play. And he said, sure, I'll go. Well, at, and they went down there, and at the end of the first period, William got tired and told Brennan that he had to leave. And again, here we go, separation. Uh, somebody's tired, somebody doesn't feel well. And he leaves, and he tells Brendan that he's going to call Claire and get a ride home. So as he's walking out, he calls Claire, and, and Claire says, okay, I'll drive down there to the arena. When Claire's two blocks away, she calls him and asks for the exact location where he's at, and Brend, or William asks somebody nearby, and he, she hears him yell back, 99 Nashua Street. And she goes, oh, I know exactly where that is. I'm just around the corner. Uh, and he says, hey, I think my phone's going to die, and it goes dead. She turns the corner a minute later 
on to the location where he's supposed to be, and she doesn't see him. So she drives up to the front, gets out by the arena, starts walking around, doesn't see anything, honks the horn, yells, looks around for an hour, gives up, drives home, and calls Boston and Quincy Police Department. And she's told that she has to wait 24 hours before she can report Will is missing. Following days, he doesn't come home. She calls him incessantly, nothing. Files a missing person report. Well, Monday, that Monday, Boston PD puts two boats in the water where these rivers are right next to the arena looking for anything. Well, the police department informs her that they confirmed that they found his cell phone smashed into a million pieces, and they confirmed it was his but didn't say where they found it. And they said they still hadn't found anything else other than the smashed up phone. Well, friends and family were interviewed and said that the ki- what happened is stunningly out of character. That was the quote. Six days after he disappears, on October 14th, Boston police is on routine patrol near the Suffolk County Jail on Nashua Street, very near the arena, and they see something in the water. William's body is recovered 25 feet from shore, and his wallet and his keys are on his body. The district attorney gives an interview and says that William was found in the water, and we believe he was in the water for a couple of days. He was missing for five days and six hours. Well, the important part to me in this is that they couldn't determine the cause of death. He's in the water for only a couple days out of the five days, six hours he's gone. It's a consistency where the cell phone goes dead in relationship to his disappearance. And Mm -hmm. there's a relationship there where he's tired and tells people he has to leave that makes him in that position of almost susceptibility. It it, it seems like these people are literally targeted. And, you know, on the trail, uh, I've told people before in the other Missing 411 books, there's almost like something's watching you, an opportunity knocks, and you're gone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So in a bunch of these cases, these people are supposedly in the, in the water for quite a while, yet their wallets are still found in their pants. And that's kind of unusual, isn't it? I find it really, really unusual in some of these cases where the water's moving fast and there's this tumbling effect and your keys and your wallet are still on you. I mean, that's unbelievable, which either goes to the point that they're not in that location very long or they're put in a position where Somebody, something wants you to know who that person is. Yeah. It, it, it's almost like something is picking certain people, doing whatever it's doing with them, and then putting them back, but putting them back, you know, dead from whatever, but not, you know, but kind of like, okay, here's the person you were looking for. And they put them back right where people were already looking. Yeah. To ensure that you're found and to ensure that you're going to be identified. Yeah. And what what is the oldest case in this book? Oh, I I think it might have been the case in New York where a, a girl from India disappeared. Oh, yes. Okay. That was like 1928 or so? Yeah. Yeah. And so, and, and most of these cases are men too, by the way. Yes, most of them are, but there's a couple of female cases that are right on for that profile hit. Yeah. So you have one, you have uh, 1928, you have one in 1944, uh, but the majority of them happen later. Yeah, and and I'm not sure if that's because I'm inept at finding these archived cases, or maybe, and I and I think this is the case that back 20, 30 years ago, if somebody drowned or presumed to drown, didn't make a lot of press. Mm. There wasn't a lot written about it because it's not a crime. Right. And so I think many times even the press overlooked it and wouldn't even write anything about it. Or if they did write something, it was a two or three line sentence about so-and-so was found in the river drowned. Right, right. Because they wouldn't have thought, until recently, nobody looked at these as being unusual. And it wasn't until recently that we had the advanced forensic capabilities to do toxicology at the level we can today. True, true. 
Um, now, in the case of Alexander Grant, we have some very odd behavior from him that was actually caught on camera after he more or less disappeared. Not, not fully disappeared, but on his way to disappearing. Uh, very true. And, you know, we, we've talked about these kids that stellar people, straight arrows, not, not troublemakers, uh, great judgment, uh, had a rounded out life that they did things voluntarily. They were they were just the wholesome people you'd want living next door to you. And Alexander Grant was one of those. Uh, March 6, 2011, 2.11 a.m., Saratoga, Saratoga Springs, New York. Well, Alexander graduated from Briarcliff High School in New York in 2009. He was recognized for his special ability in music. He won a regional talent prize uh, by Intel on a talent search. He enrolled in Boston College, majored in economics, economics, and for three years interned at a financial advisory firm while he was going to school full-time. He donated his time to Meals on Wheels, the Robin Hood Foundation, Doctors Without Borders. Again, he's one of these guys that just wanted to do the right thing. And he played keyboard in a band called the Jays. Well, Saratoga Springs is about 15 miles northwest of Bennington, Vermont, which to me is interesting because Bennington is another geographical cluster area of a large magnitude that I've written about in books. On March 5, 2011, Alexander drove to Saratoga Springs to visit a friend that was attending Skidmore College, a guy named Mike Perlow. He picked up Michael and they drove into the dorms at about 8.30 at night. They hung out, they drank beer at a dorm. At 10.30, they boarded a bus and went downtown. Now, I put that in the book because this goes to the integrity of the people. They didn't want to drive drunk. They took a bus downtown. Good judgment. Right. And they were dropped at Van Dam and Clinton Streets. They walked to a party at 146 Church Street, and he was last seen dancing with a female at sometime between 11 and 11.30. He was then seen walking to another area of the house, and that's the last time he was seen by anybody at the party. The police ended up breaking up the party at about 12.30. Friends sent him text messages to Alexander at 1.37, and at noon the following day, he never answered him. Well, Alexander had planned to spend the night with friends the night he disappeared, and his friend said his disappearance was completely and totally out of character for the type of person he was. Now, police get told of his disappearance. They do an investigation. Well, the next morning, there's closed-circuit television that shows somebody going, walking near the station lane, not far from the house at 11.30 at night. And he's seen on West Avenue staggering in front of a building. Then he walked out behind the building, and he was near some railroad tracks, and he was last seen on closed circuit at 11.34, and then he's not seen for two hours anywhere in the city. At 1.30 a.m., CCTV catches him kicking in a window at a small office building. He squeezes through the window and he cuts himself. At the time, he's wearing one sock, no shoes, long sleeve shirt, and shorts. He's not wearing a coat, he's not wearing long pants, he's not wearing shoes, and he's not wearing his other sock. This is after he wasn't seen anywhere for two hours. He cut himself entering the building, and he acted somewhat disoriented or intoxicated. Now, he's seen leaving that building about 45 minutes later near 2.15, and he's alive. And at about this time, freezing snow and rain are hitting the area. I want everyone to stop at this point and say, the guy has been in a warm building for 45 minutes. Chances are he's got a little bit more sober, and for sure the hypothermia is starting to leave the body. So any rational way or reason to leave the building isn't there. He might as well just stay. But he was bleeding pretty good. So freezing snow and rain are hitting the area at about the time he crawls back through the window. He's not seen again. Sarasota, or, uh, Saratoga Springs police get called the next day by the office building owners about the break-in. And they put the missing person and the break-in together and they start looking around for more blood, but the rain had washed a lot of this blood away. So he was reported as a missing person, and the police and fire department start searching that area within a half mile of the building. 
they find his pants and his wallet on a snowbank between Carolyn Lane and the railroad tracks where he was seen during that two-hour period, or before the two-hour period. They searched the creek visually, and they searched for two days. The end of the second day, the fire department finds his body in four feet of water submerged and held in by tree branches. He's 30 feet from the footprints that they had seen, and he's one mile from the house party. The coroner determined that he drowned with his blood alcohol level originally reported at 0.11, later retested at 0.16. People need to remember that Alexander could have stood up in that creek. It was so shallow. And the ridiculous nature of him being in this creek when he could have walked across it easily isn't lost on many people. Now, the district attorney made a statement, and when they, his blood alcohol was 0.1, it said, they said that the meager 0.11% blood alcohol content raises more questions than answers, the district attorney conceded, adding that we still don't know what affected his body to such a significant degree, which then led to the circumstances that caught, caused his death. What they were saying is, this doesn't make sense. His cell phone and his shoes were never found. And many of these these disappearances do come in clusters, too, just like you were finding in the national parks. Absolutely. On the back of the book, there's a map, and in the map you can see the clustering effect. The, uh, in this case, though, it, it, the fact that he's seen with one, one, one sock on and all kinds of essentially messed up breaking into the office is definitely the odd thing out in this case. We don't have that in any other case, do you? No. Which makes you, I mean, it really makes you wonder what happened. Like, did he get away from whoever grabbed him and then they grabbed him again? Right. Um, and again, why, obviously, why didn't he stay in the office? That's the million-dollar question. What, but, you know, you, you have these incidents where some, it, it appears as though they're pulled out somehow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, they're just snatched up. I think in the book you compare it to, like, a, one of those toy grab machines. And I got to give that credit to my son. He just graduated college. He's, he knows the stories. And he says, Dad, it's like that analogy where you're at an arcade and you have this machine that, that you try to drop over something. You pick it up into the claw and then you move it across the machine and you drop it into another location. And he says, that's kind of what it reminds me of. Yeah. But what could do that is the bigger question. Can you tell me? <laughs> I wish I could. Um, I know, as you said, some people have suggested, you know, aliens. Um, I, the problem I have with that is that we don't even know if aliens exist. Yeah. You know, if, if we had some proof that there were aliens, I'm sure there are people who argue with that statement and say we have proof, but we don't actually have proof that aliens exist. Um, we have proof there are UFOs, but we don't have proof exactly what they are. And when, when you connect this to uh, what's McCall's work on the abduction experience, Mac, uh, you also see connections to the fairy faith and such and folklore uh, and the way they would take people. And that also gets connected into the UFO phenomena by people like John Keel and Jacques Vallée. Correct. So this may be all connected in some weird way, but it may we may be seeing different parts of it. And we're also going to get into... Uh, in, in the second part, I think we'll get into a little bit of the connections to cattle mutilation, which also get kind of tied into all of this. Well, one of the things that several people who have read these books tell me is that, Dave, uh, like the example of the men or these college young men that get dropped in the river, there's intentions there that we want, somebody wants us to find them. Yeah. Because those bodies could be dumped in the middle of the woods, they could be buried. The, you know, if they have the ability to take somebody in the middle of a town when we don't see them, then they have the ability to put the person in the middle of the Atlantic and we'll never find them. But they don't. Right. They put them someplace where we will find them. And when I talk about the unusual nature of the body in the water, bodies protruding, bodies floating face up when they shouldn't be, 
uh, coroners being unable to determine the cause of death time after time after time with these cases. Well, my my in, in my mind, I'm always wondering. So, if they were taken, and somebody is using them, what are they using them for? Yes, because they don't seem to be harmed in any way necessarily. Harm that we understand. Right. I mean, they're they're not coming back with obvious physical damage, except for in a handful of cases. Right. So what, yeah, what what's the purpose behind it? Well, you know, one of the things that uh, that I keep saying over and over again is that, uh, and I, I don't mind saying it because the guy deserves to have credit, but Kevin Gannon uh, really did a job in determining that these things are occurring and that people have been ignoring it for a long, long time. And I... Unfortunately, you know, he, his work wasn't picked up the way it should be. But I, I'll read this statement that he made, and I think it is so on key for what's been happening in the Missing 411 books I read before and these in this book. He made this statement. They can, we're talk, they're talking about the suspects. They cannot be touched. They cannot be caught. They are superior. This is the collective mentality of an organization of killers. The victims represent cases that can be linked not by association to the same killers, but rather by association to the same ideology and purpose to their murders. Yeah, but that doesn't explain how the people are disappearing. No, but what I think is interesting is that when you take that statement from Gannon, when he had never heard about our work, right? it's easily transferable. Absolutely, absolutely. As you said, it's it's a perfect predator because it's never been caught. Right. It's never hiccuped. We've never had a real inkling to what's going on. You know, and maybe this last case where he was running around, you know, breaking into the office, maybe he almost got away. Yeah, and, you know, the unfortunate part of that is that the ones that do survive don't have a memory which matches what I've written about in the other books. Yeah, yeah. And that makes you wonder if the memory is being wiped somehow or if they're experiencing something that their brain doesn't quite uh, click with. I mean, like, like a dream happens in an altered state, and some people don't remember any of their dreams because they happen in that altered state. Correct. So if something is happening around them that they can't quite process, maybe that's part of the reason they, they can't remember it when they come back. It just gets kind of blocked out. Yep, I agree. So continuing with... Uh, some of the stuff in your new book, Missing 411, A Sobering Coincidence. And when, when did this get published? Uh, it came out about a week ago. And uh, one thing I would tell people is please don't go to Amazon. We're not selling it on Amazon. Somebody said today that they want 200 bucks for it on Amazon. Oh, wow. We sell it through our website, canammissing.com. C-A-N as in Nora, A-M as in Mary, canammissing.com. So essentially CanadianAmericanMissing.com. Perfect. And uh, it's only 25 bucks on your site. That's it. Okay. And yeah, it, it seems like people are just uh, ripping people off on Amazon. Not that it's the first time. Yeah. I know. But uh, the, the price is, I mean, obviously you're in demand. Yeah, well, that's always a good thing, right? If people can just get the, the information out there that Amazon's not the place to buy it. That's for sure. Now, you don't have these out as ebooks. No. You know, there's eight different forms of ebooks, and we just didn't want to go there and it's hard enough just to get the books out. Oh, I'm sure. And These are not short books. No, there's there's a lot in there, and you know it's it, it's tough to put all of the information into a format that's an easy read that doesn't get too bong, bungled down, and yet still holds your interest, uh, but still tells a story that's convincing enough for you to understand how how complex this is. Yeah, yeah. Because if, if the problem with dry facts, which is essentially what you're reporting, you're just going in here and giving people the facts and showing them the the points where they line up. Yes. And uh, I think you do a great job of making it very readable and very and, and entertaining to read, as well as giving you the information you need. Oh, I appreciate that, sir. Thanks. I mean, as as dark of a subject as it is, you know. It's uh, 
it's an intriguing mystery. Well, it's held my interest for all these years, and uh, <laughs> I, I wish I could say that we've made some huge progress in trying to understand it, but I will say that, like I said earlier, there's another spoke in the wheel. Yeah, well, it, it seems like, if anything else, we, you can eliminate certain things you know it's not. Yeah. You and I might be able to, but others out there saying, no, 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 it's... <laughs> Well, when we get done with these cases, we'll we'll discuss some of the things that that it just really can't be at this point, um, and some of those are fairly popular answers. But let's talk about Joshua Snell. So, 22 years old, June 12, 2005, 2 a.m., Eau Claire, Wisconsin. He drove there from uh, his house in Hastings, Minnesota. He was attending a friend's wedding on June 11th, and. Uh, he, he left on the 11th, went to the wedding. Later that night, early in the morning, uh, he went to a bar downtown, 324 Water Street, and he drank for a while. And then he called a friend and said, hey, I'm going to stop by at 2 a.m. She said, great, come on by. And at 5 p.m. the following night, or later that same day, but that night, he was reported as a missing person. Now, he supposedly made a cell phone call uh, early that morning, saying he was in a brushing, brushy area, hiding and scared. And the firefighters heard about this, and they focused on the river area right away. And they hit it pretty hard, and they didn't find anything. But they did later, the following day, they found a shirt on a river bank uh, on the Chippewa River near Owens Park. Now, if you fast forward three more days, uh, the search had eventually stopped because they didn't find anything. A couple was canoeing on that same river, and they found his body. And what's interesting about this is that nothing was ever released on the cause of his death or his blood alcohol level. But I go back to that Cohen Finnerty case where he was said he was being chased through the woods by a couple of yeah. big guys. Very similar to this. Why would he be scared, and why would he be hiding in a brushy area? Yeah, and that's exactly what it brought to mind, is, is that case in the last book. Yeah. And you don't get a lot of people being chased in these accounts, but that, that's two who then died mysteriously, and it may be that we just don't hear from them when this is happening. Yeah, those phone messages are rare, but I think some of them are pretty revealing if, if you look at the totality of the different calls. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to get to some, some very odd cases here in this hour uh, that may tell us a little more about who might be chasing them, I think. Um, well, maybe a little less about who might be chasing them. Uh, so a lot of these people end up disappearing from places like bars. And I think the case of Brian Schaefer is a really good one to to show people that uh, they're, they're really just disappearing. So if there's one story in this book that's brought more tears to my eyes, it's this one. And I, and I don't, know, don't know exactly why, other than I have so much compassion for the dad on this one. And Brian Schaefer, 27 years old, again, stellar individual, brilliant man. Uh, April 1st, 2006, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, I've written before about the physicians that have vanished under unusual circumstances. Well, in this instance, the Schaefer family was devastated in a 29-month period around this date. And on March 6th, Brian was a brilliant second-year medical student at Ohio State. He had great grades. Everything in his life was perfect. He had a longtime girlfriend. He was described as loved by friends, everybody's buddy. Well, Brian had his dad named Randall and a mom named Renee and a brother named Derek, and they were all a really tight group. Well, in March, in March 2006, Renee died of cancer. And the brother, the dad, and Brian just kind of rallied together as a real tight group. Well, when Renee died, this left Randall at home alone in Fairfield County, Ohio, while Brian was going to school. Well, on March 31st, 2006, Brian Schaefer and Randall 
met for dinner at a place called the East Side Steakhouse in uh, Columbus, Ohio. And after dinner, hugged his dad, said, okay, we'll be in touch. And Brian set off to meet a friend at the Ugly Tuna Saloon in town. Pretty famous place. And Brian was leaving the next day with his girlfriend for Miami. At 10 p.m. that night, Brian calls his girlfriend at her parents' house in Columbus, and they finalize plans to meet the next day. Well, Brian was with a friend at the bar at the Ugly Tuna, and at some point, the friend says they got separated, and he couldn't find Brian. He called him many times, and he couldn't get him on the phone. And the following day, Brian doesn't meet his girlfriend, and he's reported as a missing person. Now, this guy was a second-year medical student, great grades, brilliant, didn't mess around, didn't fool with drugs, and he, he vanished. The case goes to a guy named Detective Brian Edwards from Columbus Police Department. And I, I read a lot about shoddy police work. Not this guy. He did a good job. He did a great job. He took the case, and he pulled all of the CCTV footage from the Ugly Tuna Saloon. And there's an escalator that leads up to the saloon, and that's the only way in and out. And there's CCTV on the back door. There's, it's completely covered. Edward spends dozens and dozens and dozens of hours watching this video inside out and backwards. Brian is, or I'm sorry, Brian, yeah, is seen at the top of the stairs talking to some women late at night. And he's seen on CCTV footage turning around, going back in the bar. And Brian Edwards, the detective, said he watched the footage nonstop for hours, and he guaranteed that Brian Schaefer never was seen on video footage leaving the bar. And there was no other way to get out. And he is completely stumped what happened to him. Now, Randall, the dad, worked tirelessly trying to find his son. He went to work for Crime Stoppers, and he tried to help other families. He was an excellent saxophone player, and he played at church. So you've got to understand, one month he loses his wife, the next month he loses his son. 25 months later, after Brian vanishes, September 14, 2008, a huge windstorm goes through Ohio. And Randall is walking through the yard that they're in, and a tree falls over and kills him. Unbelievable. Now, Detective Edwards has Brian Schaefer's image just imprinted on his mind forever. A couple of years after Brian disappears, Detective Edwards is working in an Ohio State football game and sees a face in the crowd 50 yards away, and he goes, I, I was on it. I had to follow it. And he followed it, stops the guy. It's Derek Schaefer, Brian's brother. That's, yeah. that's how on key this detective was on facial recognition. Now, Brian Schaefer's never been found. He is gone. The reason I put that in the, this case in the book is that it's one of those cases where the two friends are separated in the bar. They have video evidence that Brian Schaefer was at the bar, but he's never seen leaving the bar. And there are multiple cases in the books where that exact scenario plays out, but there isn't this constant video surveillance of the bar to prove that he never did come out. The uh, the fact that I mean, for someone to be able to remove someone from a bar without anyone noticing is almost unthinkable. Now, how would you do it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, where I said to you off air before we we did this. I mean, I'm leaning toward two possibilities. Either we're looking at something paranormal outside what we understand as reality, or we're looking at some type of technology that goes way beyond anything we know that exists. Because we don't know of any rational way someone could just disappear just like that. And I want people to go back to what I said earlier is that Schaefer was brilliant. He was, a, he was on his way to being a physician. 
This isn't some drunk in an alleyway. There, there seems as though there is distinct logic of people with a specific profile being targeted. And, and a lot of the people in this book are found. That's not always the case in the wilderness. But in these cases, it almost seems like they're, they're intending them to be found more often than not. Yes, correct. And this is one of those rare instances where the guy's never found. Um, you also note in this book that a number of people have disappeared from the same hotels. You know, there's uh, the Sheraton Towers in Chicago. Uh, you think about the number of the hotels in Chicago, and two from the same hotel. I think, I, I didn't write about that many cases in Chicago, but two from the same hotel fit in the same profile. Very strange. But, you know, I've written about a hotel in Southern California before where there's been many, many weird, weird, strange things that have happened and probably the strangest disappearance of them all happened there. So I think that there is something, there's something to be said to understand and to have some history of the, behind the place that you're going to stay at. Yeah. Now, one of the things I noticed uh, in this book is a lot of these people who are disappearing are not only of you know high intelligence, but a lot of them are very religious as well. And that seems to, I put that in the book because it started to strike me when I was doing this that a lot are. Hmm. And I wonder what, why that is. I mean, what, why these certain sets of characteristics are, seem to be important. You mentioned uh, a lot of them are German. I mean, by no means all of them, but a, but a more than normal amount have German heritage. Uh, you mentioned that quite a number of them are uh, have uh, type 1 diabetes. The, uh, let's see, what, 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 what were some of the other things you were finding in there? You know, one of the things that, there's many with dementia, there's many with autism, there's many that have some type of congenital disability. And I don't know if it just happens to be a random occurrence or what, but I do put that in the books and so people can understand that it seems to show up more times than not. Right, and it's not something you find in the majority of the population. No. Uh, and that's the same with uh, type 1 diabetes. There's a lot of type 2 diabetes, but type 1 is, is much less common. So to have a number of people in this book that had type 1 diabetes is actually a little bit odd. Yeah, and especially the people out there that have type 1 diabetes that are German, huh? Yeah. Um, so, one of the things... Okay, so some of the cases in the book, like, for instance, you have one from Ithaca College here, and he drowned in a pond, or appeared to drown in a pond come, walking home from a party. In that case, I mean, it does fit the criteria of what you're looking at, but it also isn't so odd that it couldn't have just maybe happened. And there's, there's a few cases here and there where it seems like maybe they really did possibly just get drunk and fall in the river because they were found fairly soon after they disappeared and there's not any obstacles to where they're found necessarily. Um, one of the things I was thinking, uh, being diabetic myself, is that diabetes can sometimes cause odd behavior. But I don't think any of the cases where anyone was diabetic were that they were seen doing anything particularly unusual. Right. Exactly. And I, I think that when you, when you think about the people that have this hereditary condition or a congenital condition, how would anybody know you have that condition? Yeah. Well, for something like that, there, there could be a scent. I do believe they train dogs to tell when, when some people's blood sugar rises. I mean, it does change your, phys your, you know, your, your system if the blood sugar gets high or low. So maybe something's picking up on it. Yeah, plausible. Or maybe they've been watched for a very long time. Maybe, maybe I, I don't know. It, it's so, there's so many possibilities and so many ways to go with this. It just... The, the patterns you're finding don't make sense to us looking at it from the direction we're looking at it. Correct. Um, have you ever found any G GHB in anyone from uh, the cases in the wilderness? So you've got to understand something, that this isn't on the primary toxicological screening right. that medical examiners do. 
So that's number one. And number two, in the woods, uh, I've written a lot about that the victims are found, if they're found alive, they're semi-conscious or unconscious. Yeah. And if you think about that, that fits that GHB uh, symptomology. And they just wouldn't think to check for it. No. Exactly. Huh. All right. Well, let's get to one of the weirdest cases in this book. And that's Elisa, Elisa or Eliza Lamb? I'll go with whatever you say. <laughs> and she's, she may be probably the well, most well-known case in this book because her video went viral on the Internet a year or so ago. And if people go to YouTube and put in her first name, E-L-I-S-A, and her last name is Lam, L-A-M, you'll be able to watch it. Uh, January 31st, 2013, Los Angeles is when it happened. And I'll first talk about the location. It's the Cecil Hotel, 640 South Main Street in L.A. Depending on where you read it, it opened in 1924 or 1927. That's 14 floors. There's four water tanks on a platform on the roof. The roof is restricted access. It's locked. You can't get up there, and it's alarmed. Uh, the hotel is an advertised location for business people, but most people would consider the area it's in as a skid row. Some history behind it is uh, a guy named Richard Ramirez was known as a night stalker. He was convicted of 13 killings between 84 and 85. He lived on the 14th floor for $14 a night, and some people called his killings satanic. In 1991, an Austrian named Jack Untweger came to the U.S. and lived at the Cecil. He supposedly was a journalist covering crime in L.A., and he lived at the hotel for five weeks and killed three prostitutes in his room. In 1964, Goldie Osgood was staying in the hotel. She was stabbed, raped, and killed there. Oh, man. In the 50s to the 60s, the Cecil got notoriety as a location with the most suicides. In 54, a woman named Helen Gurney jumped and killed herself. In 62, Julie Moore jumped and killed herself. In 62, again, a woman named Pauline Otten jumped out the window, landed on a pedestrian, both were killed. And what I say in, in the book at this point is I say, wouldn't you like to know the history of the location <laughs> you're staying in? Yeah. Well, how about the history of the room you're staying in? Would you be comfortable staying in the room that Richard Ramirez killed 13 people in? You know, I would at least like to be aware of it. Man, you're brave, sir. I, I wouldn't want to stay there. <laughs> <laughs> because that way, if something odd happened or I started feeling weird, I might be able to connect to why. Yeah, until you're flying out the window looking at concrete below. <laughs> true, true. And then that says, did these activities in this place cause this place to to get a bad vibe that caused these things, or is it the location all along? Cause and effect, who knows, right? Yeah. So Lisa Lamb, she was a psychology student from University of British Columbia. As by chance, UBC is a case I've written about two other students who disappeared under unusual circumstances. And she was on a holiday break, her Chinese family owned a restaurant in a town called Burnaby just outside of Vancouver. She rode Amtrak to L.A. She got a room with the Cecil. Now, why she went to the Cecil, we'll never know. Uh, but while she was there, she went to the San Diego Zoo. She saw Conan O'Brien's show. And we know this because of Facebook posts. Her friends stated she would never drink alcohol and would never smoke or use drugs. She called her parents daily and reported in just to keep in touch. And her parents knew something went wrong when she stopped calling. So her parents called Vancouver police to report her as a missing person. And Vancouver, in turn, called LAPD. And LAPD, in turn, went to the hotel and brought in search dogs to scour the hotel from the basement to the ceiling. And they brought dogs to the ceiling, up onto the roof, and no scent was picked up. Nothing suspicious was found. Not, no locks were tampered with, nothing was broken, no alarms were malfunctioning, everything worked. Now, on April 14th, LAPD released a CCTV footage of Elisa on the elevator in the hotel. She 
She was wearing black shorts, a red sweatshirt, sandals. She enters the elevator, she presses the buttons, and backs herself into the corner. People say she looks frightened. Some say she's talking to somebody. She turns around and peeks out into the hallway. She goes in and out of that elevator a couple times. And eventually, she, the elevator won't move even though she's pressing buttons. And she exits, and she's never seen again alive. Now, fast forward to February 19th, 2013, and residents in the hotel are complaining about low water pressure. A maintenance man takes a ladder to the roof, turns off the alarm to the door, unlocks the door, and goes up onto the roof. And he's made his way up to four 1,000-gallon tanks that are sitting on this platform about four or five feet up off the top of the hotel. Each tank is about four foot in diameter and eight feet tall. There isn't a ladder to get to the top of the tank, so he had to bring a ladder to get to the top to open the latch to look inside. Now, he opens the secure latch on the tank, and inside he sees Elisa floating face up naked. Obviously, something's really wrong. So he calls LAPD. They respond with the robbery homicide team, and they bring in their crime scene crew. They say that the tank is too small to remove the body, so they have to cut a hole in it to get her out. They find her sandals around her in the tank. There's no visible injuries to the body. On February 20th, CBC Canada, one of the big news agencies in Canada, has a scheduled interview with LAPD detectives about the case, and they cancel the interview at the 11th hour, and they won't talk. On February 22nd, the coroner's report comes out as inconclusive cause of death. Four months later, the coroner comes out with a supplemental report stating it was accidental death by drowning. They never tested for GHB. They stated that her blood alcohol level was 0.02, but that was caused by decomposition in the body. That, that mm. tends to put your blood alcohol level a little bit up. I requested and got a 27-page coroner's report from the L.A. coroner's. I requested a copy of the LAPD report on the case. I was denied. L.A. said they wouldn't release their police report. Uh, the coroner's report listed that her clothing that was found in the tank was exactly the same that was seen in the elevator footage. They stated that it wasn't suicide and there was no foul play involved. What I write in the book is you've got to think logically here. If the death was accidental, you must believe Elisa went to the roof, somehow bypassed a locked door, somehow bypassed the roof alarm, somehow managed to walk up the side of a, or managed to get up the side of a slick tank with no ladder, managed to get inside the tank, managed to take off all of her clothes, and then she drowned. And, and not only that, but since they couldn't get the body out, how would she have gotten in? You're singing to the choir with that statement. <laughs> what, what do you make of this? Uh, you know, this one bothers me more than some of the other ones, and maybe it's just because I saw the video. Uh, but when I first looked at this case, I mean, it's it's not only puzzling, but I, I you can you can really feel for her when she's sitting in that that elevator, just kind of freaking out. And I think most people's first response is that she's on something, you know. But obviously, they did the toxicology, and her friend said she didn't do drugs, and. You know, there's no easy explanation for what's happening there. And there's also no good explanation for why the, the elevator isn't responding. Correct. Um, her behavior isn't just like she's hiding from somebody. It's like she's trying to figure out what's going on. Right. And then, of course, again, as you said, how did she get to the roof? How did she get inside there? I mean, why would she get inside there? Um, it's just... It's so hard to wrap your brain around. It just literally does not make sense. The facts don't add up. If Elisa had made her way to that roof, and if she had somehow crawled up that platform and crawled up the side of that tank, 
her scent would have been all over that platform and all over that tank. Yeah. And there was none. Why, and, and I've, in all my books I've talked about these, why would she be found in that tank naked? Yeah. And there's, cause there's no reason her clothes would have come off just by being in the tank. No. And it's not a place you go for a swim. No. Now, if that wasn't unusual enough, I was reading LA news around this time and this article came up and I almost, I almost fell out of my chair. I have a friend that's in the medical <laughs> business and they could not believe what I had just shown them. So Elisa's pulled from that water cistern on February 19th, 2013. On February 21st, two days later, there's an article in the LA Times about the Center for Disease Control dispatching a group of scientists to LA to understand a, a sudden surge in this atrocious strain of spreading tuberculosis that they can't seem to control. Now, first of all, for the CDC to respond to a group of scientists anywhere it takes a major miracle, but they did. That tells you how bad it must have been. So they respond, and the scientists in the article stated that they would be using, now follow this, the lamb slash ELISA TB test in this incident. This is not a joke. They would be using the lamb, L-A-M, slash ELISA, E-L-I-S-S-A, TB test to confirm the presence in these victims. We go back and we did a history on this test, and it existed as long as eight years ago before this incident happened. Now, you tell me, is that the oddest set of coincidences you've ever heard? Yeah, it, it, that's another one. I mean, a coincidence a coinc is a coincidence, but that's just, what are the chances that that's going to drop right at that same location two days after she was pulled from the tank? Well, and you have to understand that she's pulled from the tank on the 19th. They respond a team two days later, meaning that the tuberculosis had to have been running rampant for at least a couple of weeks beforehand for it to get elevated to the point that they sent scientists out. True, true. So if Elisa was in town on the or in town uh, sometime before the 31st, like the 25th, and they respond scientists on the 21st of February, there's your run. And how odd is it that this test is named, her name reversed? Yeah. Because how often does that happen, period, that you'll find a test like that that, that is the reversal of someone's name? And it's not like her name is a real common name. No, not at all. So, yeah. one more pretty odd one, circumstance, coincidence, is that... Uh, there's a website that drew a correlation between the facts of Elisa's case in a tank with a movie that was called Dark Water. Yeah, that, that's the first thing that came to mind when I read about this case, because I had seen that movie. Oh, well, tell us about it. Uh, it's, <laughs> all right, uh, it's a ghost story. The original is uh, Japanese, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah, is it, it is. Japanese? It is. Yeah, okay. Um, and it's about a, a girl who has drowned in the water tank on top of the building. And there's a lot with ghosts, and especially with hair, like hair coming out of the sinks and stuff like that, if, or if I remember right. It's been a, been a few years since I saw it. Kind of weird. But you, Yeah, it is kind of weird. Because like I said, it's the very first thing that came to mind, is that movie of the, the girl in the water tank on the roof. <laughs> right. Yeah, and then uh, you kind of brought this up earlier with cattle mutilations. Yeah, You know, I, I think I'm a mile wide and an inch deep because I, I read a lot of peripheral things that probably have nothing to do with missing people, but I read them anyhow. And in Chris O'Brien's book, Stalking the Herd, I read that. And I know Chris, and he's a good writer. And he wrote about uh, some cattle in Argentina, I think it was, that disappeared. And the guy went down and he found them all in a tub or a water tank, and he couldn't understand how they could get themselves up into this tank in any way plausible. 
And I wrote that in the book because I don't want people to think that I'm trying to put myself in a corner on this, but I'm keeping an open mind, trying to find similar things that have happened. Now, in George Knapp's book, uh, Skinwalker. Yeah, Hunt for the Skinwalker, yeah. uh, This family came home and found three of their steers inside of a camper stuffed so tight that they couldn't even move, and they had to cut the camper apart to get them out. Not only that, but I think it was locked. Probably. And so there's a couple of very, very strange incidents about how certain things got into a location, didn't make sense, almost seemed implausible and impossible. And I think you could almost say that about what's happened here to Elisa. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. But not only that, there are other connections to cattle mutilations as well, uh, because many of the... Uh, the bodies that, that that are mutilated seem to have been dropped from a height. So if, if you're right about them being suddenly just snatched up into the air, it would make sense. I mean, this is one of the theories of what's going on with cattle mutilations, because there's never any blood or any sign that anything's been done in the area that the cattle are found, and they seem to have just been dropped back into place. Well, and, and I'll, I will say something factual here, and I say it in the book is that one of the most unusual things I found in the coroner's report, and you won't probably hear about it anywhere, is that the coroner stated that they didn't do toxicology on the blood because there wasn't enough blood in the system to get toxicology results. And that was with Elisa? Right. Yeah. And that's, again, very common with cattle mutilations because they do seem to be drained of blood with no blood on the site, nothing... uh, uh, under the body or anything. Right. So th- there are connections, even though these people aren't being mutilated. Um, also, if people are taking cattle and mutilating them, whatever they're really doing with them, they don't have to bring them back. Just like these people could just disappear forever. Why are they being put back for us to find? Yeah, well, why, don't, why aren't the cattle put in the, you know, in the middle of nowhere? Why are they put right back in the same location where they came from? Yeah, exactly. They're, they're, it's almost like pe- these, whatever's doing it wants us to find it. Right. And there are, I mean, there are some isolated cases here and there of supposed human mutilations, but I don't know if any of those have ever been, you know, like really solidly researched. Yeah, I haven't seen anything along those lines that I would, you know, put my heart and soul into. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's it's different in that respect. There is no mutilation going on. The bodies, in fact, almost seem too good for being dead. Right. Versus the mutilations where something has obviously done a lot of damage to the, to the body, and we can tell why the cattle died. We just don't know how. Yeah, it's a, I, I wish I understood what happened to uh, Lisa. Or, uh, I, I wish I could talk to a detective and understand their theory about what happened. But to say it was an accident, you must believe that she went up there and purposely went into that tank. Well, I I wonder, too, if it's just that they're in such a situation where they realize this doesn't make any sense. What are we supposed to tell people? And that's why they don't want to give an interview. Yeah, yeah. Have Have you tried talking to any of these people? Well, first of all, I don't even know who the homicide team... the. You work in teams on homicide. I don't know which homicide team did it, but Mm. I reached out to L.A. twice through their press information officers trying to get a copy of the report, and they said, nope, we're never going to release it. Huh. I was shocked just to get the coroner's report. So so you're running into the same type of uh, blocks as you do in national parks, but from a different angle. Correct. And and in in this case, though, it's... It may be less organized than the national parks. It almost seems like the national parks just have a, a thing about not giving out this information, whereas these police offices may just not want people to realize there's something, you know, like less organized level of not wanting people to realize that they don't have the answers to these things. Right. Um, you know, it's easier if people can just believe a suicide or a drowning is easier than saying we have no idea where this person was for five days. Well, police officers are notorious for not wanting to be questioned about their judgment. 
mm. and not wanting anyone to take a second look at what they've done. So if there's any question about what happened with something, they're better off not releasing anything than allowing somebody to take that second look. Now, you talked about a, uh, a town meeting or something where the, the parents and some of the people were really upset that the police weren't uh, looking into this more. Well, and, and this is a, a very brave reporter rep, uh, wrote an article about, uh, you know, a town, I think it was in Wisconsin, that uh, had a whole series of these disappearances. And the town was not buying into the rhetoric of the police saying, oh, you know, this is just a bunch of drunk college people stumbling into the water. Don't worry. We're getting under control. Everything's fine. So the police chief goes in front of a gymnasium filled with people, and he essentially got yelled out of the room. And what's amazing to me is that the reporter was willing to write that up. Because when you're a reporter in a small town, most of the news comes out of the police, and you're looking for them for statements, opinions, and conclusions, etc. And he, yeah. he essentially wrote the truth, which was, I applaud him for doing it. Yeah. But the town didn't buy into what was happening. They, they still think something unusual was going on. And that tells you something, too. People aren't stupid. They're not blind to this. The, the facts aren't lining up. Right. So let, let's look at uh, another odd one, uh, another one of the few females in this book, uh, Caitlin Louder. September 27, 2014 at 4.30, West Valley City, Utah, the only case in this area of the United States. She was born uh, January 2nd uh, in 84 in American Fork, Utah. She was known as a giving heart and always helping others. She had a BA degree from, uh, in social work from Utah State. She had a small pug dog named Phyllis. She was considered extremely non-judgmental, had a twin brother named Colton, a sister named uh, Maddie, and a brother named Parley. On 9-26-14, she was at her apartment in West Valley City, and at 9 p.m., she calls 911 complaining of a loud party in her complex where there were weapons seen. West Valley Police responds, and what they find is a wedding reception with no issues whatsoever, nobody with a gun, no problem. She makes a second call that night, hangs up to 911. A third call, she seemed confused. She had trouble remembering her address. The next morning at 8 a.m., she makes a call to the police department, There's, and her quote was, they're stealing from my house she yells get the fuck out of my house and her roommate steps up and says Kaylin there's, there's nobody here relax no no they're here they're taking stuff there's a hang up on September 27th at about noon close circuit television at the complex sees her outside walking her dog and she appears to be talking to an invisible person. Her parents claim she's talking to the dog. Now, at 4.30 that day, she leaves the apartment, her apartment in bare feet. No dog, no wallet or key is observed. But she's walking into the rain as it's falling. And that's the last time she's seen alive. Now, a friend reports her as a missing person later on. And they start to search the creeks, rivers, and streams, and housing, and everything in that area. There's a small creek that runs through the apartment complex to the Jordan River, and that was searched multiple, multiple times. It was stated by searchers that they didn't think the water in the creek had the ability to carry a body anywhere, but they searched it anyhow multiple times. On just, okay, so this was all happening around September, late September 2014. December 1st, 2014, her body is found in the West Valley City limits by workers examining a drainage pipe in the Jordan River. Her body is found almost entirely underwater in the middle of the river. Police say they, they are unknown why the body wasn't found originally because it had all been searched thoroughly. And again, they reiterate the creek near the apartment was too small to carry the body away. The coroner says that it's the cause of death was undetermined. Now, how common is it for a coroner to say that they don't know how someone died? 
Well, in these cases, it's, it's extremely common. It's almost one of those profile <laughs> points at, at this right. level. But, but over, what about, overall, no, it's not very common. Yeah, and that's what I thought. I mean, it's usually not that hard to determine a cause of death. Well, bullet hole in the head, those are easy. Right, right. You know, overdose of drugs, those are easy. Heart attacks, strokes, all those things are pretty easy. So, and drowning, there's certain elements that they look for, but those aren't, drowning isn't the cause of death in these people. Huh. And this is another case with Caitlin here where she seems to be interacting with something that we can't see. Uh, just like Elisa in the elevator where she seems to be interacting with something, possibly even talking to something that when there's nothing on the camera. Right. Um, or the guy I mentioned uh, in Steph Young's book where he says, you know, I didn't drive here, they made, they did it or whatever. And, well, who's they? What's, what's going on with these people? Is there something there they're seeing we're not? Or is their brain being affected in such a way uh, that they, they're hallucinating? And I think with Caitlin, you know, she's obviously seeing things that aren't there, the, the gunshots or the, the weapons that she reported earlier. And, uh, you know, the other police reports that made absolutely no sense. You know, years ago when I was a policeman, there was a psychiatrist that worked at uh, the medical center that was the general hospital for the county. And uh, this person was, everybody admired him. He was just a genius guy. And every once in a while, we'd have to bring in somebody that was, quote unquote, psychotic and a danger to themselves and others. And we'd turn him over and I would talk to the guy every once in a while and one time we each had some time, so I was sitting there talking to him, and he goes, you know, Dave, because every once in a while, you just got to think, do these people, are when they say they hear something, maybe they really are hearing something that we just can't hear. Yeah. Yeah, they're tuned in possibly to something that we're not. Yeah. Hmm. All right, so now let, let's let's look at a couple of uh, cases here where the person actually survived. Very strange. Uh, first one, Stephen Kubaki. This uh, happened on February 1978 in Holland, Michigan. He was a student at Hope College in Michigan, which was organized by the Reformed Church of America. It's 30 miles north uh, north of uh, South Haven. 30, uh, 76 miles south of Ludington and Baldwin, that cluster area that I talked about earlier. Right. On February 78, Stevens attending Hope and was uh, in a degree program for German. Coincidence. Right. And uh, on February 19th, he tells his roommates that he's going to go cross-country skiing. And he heads out, and he's going to go to Lake Michigan right near Saugatuck. And when he didn't return that day, his roommates file a missing person report, and Michigan State Police takes over the investigation. They call the Coast Guard. They send out some planes, some boats, tracking dogs, helicopters, foot patrols. And state police found his skis and his poles and his footprints uh, on the bank of a beach on the lake, leading his footsteps led 200 yards out onto the ice of Lake Michigan and disappeared. It's in the articles. It's right there. And, and another article said that they found his backpack in the same area. And police believed that he had drowned, fallen through the ice, and he was dead. And that's the way the case ended. And that, that I think, is a reasonable uh, assumption. Well, if you see a one-way set of tracks going out, what else are you going to think? Exactly. Now, fast forward uh, 15 months to uh, May 5th, 1979. Stephen says he wakes up uh, on a Saturday night 40 miles from his father's home in South Deerfield, Mass. John Kubaki is his dad, a 53-year-old father, thought his son was dead. And John said that Stephen told him that he lost consciousness until he woke up in Pittsfield, Mass., and said he was lying in a meadow wearing clothes that weren't his. Stephen woke up 700 miles east of Lake Michigan, almost directly east, and he, went, he made his way to his parents' home. 
1983, Stephen got an MA degree from Ohio University in linguistics, and in 92, he got a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of New Mexico. I, I tracked him down, and I called his office, and he refused to return my call. I sent him an email. He, retur- he refused to return my email. Yeah. And he, so you, you got to listen. listen he, he's a missing student. He disappeared in or around water. Uh, he says to, in the article at the time that he had no memory of what happened. Time and space were lost. And this is one of those classic cases that seems to fit every part of the profile, including loss of memory. Except for the fact that he survived. Right. And it's, it's really too bad that he's not willing to, to talk about it. Well, as other people who have read the book told me, he goes, either, the, either it's too painful to talk about or he's too scared to go back and figure out what happened. Or he's afraid it's going to hurt his career in some way. But, you you know, in a strange way, if he came out and he went through hypnotic regression and something really strange happened, there's so many people in this world that have psychological issues behind nightmares or alleged abductions and things, I think his business would blossom. Well, that's true. But he may not see it that way. True. And he may really just not, you know, you may be right, he may just not want to know. Yep. Yeah. He he he's he survived. He's in one piece. It would drive me insane. I I would need to know. Really? Yeah, I wouldn't be able to let it go. Well, it makes you wonder what other things in his life since then has happened related to this. Yeah. Or maybe he does remember now. Maybe it came back to him or maybe he did get regressed and he has no interest in talking about it. That could be. I mean, because like I said, it would drive me crazy to to know that part of my life is just not there. Yeah, 15 months. Where were you? Yeah. So, I mean, maybe he did get regret. I mean, he's in the right field to know somebody who could regress him. Oh, for sure. So, maybe he did. Maybe he didn't get anything. Maybe he got something and wasn't particularly happy about it. Yeah. I mean, that would definitely, you know, make him not respond to you. Well, the last one where the person lived is is probably one of the most on key ones in the book. But his name was Cohen yes. Cohen Fortney, January eighth, two thousand and six, two a.m., twenty one years old, La Crosse, Wisconsin. What's amazing to me is I wrote in my previous book about a guy named Cohen Finnerty, an NFL right. quarterback, and this guy's name is Cohen Fortney. What would be the odds? <laughs> you know, did somebody make a mistake and take the wrong guy one time? <laughs> Maybe. So January 8th, well, 2006, Cohen was a student at University of Wisconsin, and he was on a holiday break staying with his parents 17 miles east of the Minnesota border in Viroqua on the Mississippi River. On January 7th, he left his parents' home and drove with a friend to La Crosse, and he was staying with a friend that night. So La Crosse has 30 drinking establishments in an eight-block area, uh, there's a place called the Last Stop Bar, John's Bar at 109 Third Street, La Crosse. And the bar is a, la- a thousand feet from the Mississippi River. Somebody, so, sometime between 1.30 and 2 a.m., uh, his friends tried calling Colin, and he wouldn't answer, and they couldn't find him in the bar. He was lost. Now, Colin says the last thing he remembers is being in the bar dancing with a girl. The next thing he remembers is floating down the Mississippi River with ice around him. He pulls himself to shore. He lost his hat, his shoes, and $20 in cash. And he lies on the bank, and he hears traffic, and he slowly pulls himself up onto the traffic and looks down the street, and what does he see? But Gunderson Lutheran Medical Center, and he drags himself into the medical center at 7 a.m. Now... The water temperature was 32 degrees. The fact of this is he he could not have been in that water no more than 10 minutes. It's impossible because he wouldn't live. Probably only five minutes. Statistics say that if you're in the water 15 minutes, you're going to die. Now, if he would have stayed on that bank any longer than a couple minutes, hypothermia would have set in. He would have died. 
So at 8 a.m., La Crosse Police Department respond to the medical center, and they take his blood alcohol level, and it's 0.04%. That's like two beers. Backtracking six hours, which was the time he was gone, it would have put his blood alcohol level at 2 a.m. at 0.16. Pretty well sauced up. Mm -hmm. The distance from the bar to where he exited the river was 1.5 miles. He, they asked him repeatedly what happened, and he said, I have no memory of what happened between I was dancing at the bar and I ended up in the river. The fact is, he had to have been placed in the water at about 6.45. So that leaves four hours and 45 minutes unaccounted for. Now, what's weird about this is he was the second victim, victim that night to vanish from the same bar. The second victim woke up in the lobby of the ho uh, hospital. Both of them had no toxicological screening done for GHB. And the newspapers reported that Colin had fell in the river, which is blatantly not true, because he couldn't have. He would have been dead. And everyone says that has looked into this like I have, he had to have been held, released in the water to die. And... I want everyone to think about the number of colleges and universities in North America, including Canada, that have a large body of water near it, a river running nearby it, and why don't these incidents, if they just happen to be drunken college kids, why don't they happen equally across the U.S. at all of these locations that have these water nearby? They yeah. don't. It's specific locations. And there, again, is this clustering effect of these disappearances, just like in the other books. Were, were you able to get a hold of Cullen? You know, I didn't even try, honestly, because Gannon and Gilbertson, they went and debriefed him, and that's where he said, hey, I don't remember anything. He made those statements to them. Okay. All right. And he never went through any kind of regression to, to see if there was anything he could remember. No. And we don't know, of course, if there was any drugs in the system. No. But, you know, I mean, if someone gets essentially roofied at a bar, you know it's not something that goes unnoticed most of the time, especially if it's a bigger guy. Well, and he's at the bar with friends. If he would have been carried yeah. out, witnesses would have seen it. Exactly. That's, that's exactly what I mean. Um, and from, from what I understand, it can take someone down pretty quickly, but it's going to make a bit of a scene. Oh, for sure. Especially if he's dancing at the time. That's right. And then you still have the question of how did they dump him in the middle of the river. In all of these incidents, you got to remember, nobody has ever seen leaving the bar, getting drug out of a bar, carried out of a bar, and nobody's ever being ever seen dumped in a river, or they've, they've never seen them um, fall in or jump in the river. And you talk about at one point uh, a camera that shows a guy on a on a on the edge of a river, and when it pans back, he's gone, but no one ever sees him jump in. No, there always seems to be that if there's a camera nearby, the point you need to be seen, they're never seen. It's 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 so it seems so orchestrated. Yes. I mean, that that's the best word I have. It seems orchestrated. Someone is pulling these strings to essentially be invisible in all of this. Correct. But instead of getting, you know, something we understand, we're getting something like Cthulhu. You know, yes. you know when we try to look at the shape here. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about some of the things it really can't be at this point. And I, I think the biggest one people were married to from the beginning was uh, Bigfoot. Now, Unless there's people working with Bigfoot, I don't think Bigfoot is going into a bar and somehow kidnapping somebody. And carrying them down the street and dumping them off a bridge into a river, I, I would say right. that's pretty well certain this is not happening. And drugging them. I don't think they're getting drugged, no. <laughs> By Bigfoot. And the, the drugging one is kind of a, an important factor. If all these people are getting this drug... Either something is really setting it off in their system, that it's producing an abnormal amount, or somebody is flat-out drugging them. 
I don't see how there's any other cause and effect. You, you have to follow the logic and you have to follow the evidence. Um, the second one a lot of people like to, to latch onto is the idea of a serial killer. And with these clusters and their age, there's no way a single person could be doing all of this by any stretch of the imagination. No, and you look at the amount of time this has been going on, the number of countries involved, the number of location, locations involved, the, the dates don't make sense. It, there's no way a human could be 100% effective at eluding and not being seen, either dragging, carrying, or dumping the person. Right. Now, um, you could almost say, well, maybe there's some kind of organized group, but that still doesn't explain how they're getting them out of bars, how they've never been, as you said, never been caught in any way. No one's ever seen it happen. Um, so, I mean, for, an or, uh, for any kind of organized group, someone's going to slip up sooner or later. Someone's going to talk. Someone's going to slip up. But the best thing, and, and people have to remember this, is what is the motive and yeah. how can they get away with killing people and our forensic people can't figure out how? Yeah, and I mean, there's, there's also a lot of people speculating that it's some kind of ritual uh, murder situations, but again, how are they killing them? Correct. Are they, smarter, are they smarter than all of our scientists and medical examiners? Now, this, this is why I say if it is something like that, if it is a human agency doing this, it has to be somebody with access to much more advanced technology than what we know of. Because they're able to just snatch a person. And they're able to kill them without any sign of why they died. And they're able to put them back without any, anyone ever seeing them. Um, it would take you know, a, a century beyond the technology we have now to, to do something like that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's not impossible, but again, it, it, that's just random speculation because I don't know what else could do it in a human agency. No. Now, um, the guys who wrote on the smiley face murders, they, they believed it was a group of serial killers, right? Right. Um, and, but, how are they explaining their, their, these people's disappearances? So you got to understand that they were looking at a handful of cases. Okay. And they were looking at, uh, I mean, at the end, they were looking at many more locations, but they weren't looking at this at, at the level I was able to dig. And they didn't also have the ability to look at the research for the previous five years and say, wow, there is a relationship here. They were only looking at water, and I don't think that they understood the specific profile points that I brought into it. The, and, and there are a lot of interconnections here, although they're not immediately obvious, between the National Park disappearances and these disappearances. Because um, a lot of the National Parks ones were also around water, but people weren't always found in the water. No, a lot of them were found in dry creek beds, next to rivers, next to streams, boulder fields, things like that. Yeah. And again, the boulder fields have a lot of connections with folklore. Oh, for sure. Um, what, what, what do you think? Okay, so when you're not seeing some of the, the main points from the wilderness disappearances in these disappearances, do you think it's just because the situation is different or maybe some of those points weren't uh, weren't really there. Well, I, I do think that you have to keep an open mind, and you, it, it's almost like a moving target because if these if these incidents all involve the same group doing it, then that plausible deniability factor they don't want anyone to recognize what's going on. And so if you keep an open mind and you can continue to draw lines between the facts, then you can continue to say, well, these might all be related. But you've got to keep that open mind and you've got to look for those specific profile points. Hmm. 
You know, in, instead of uh, disappearing from berry fields, they're disappearing while in bars, crowded bars in some cases. Right. Um, and that that's the thing. I mean, you can understand someone disappearing picking berries because, well, they're out in the wilderness. They could have wandered off. They could have done this. They could have done that. But when you're in a bar, it seems like somebody would notice if you just disappeared. Yes, you would think so. But obviously, there's something going on that we don't understand that people... You know, go back to the Grozel case where the girl went to sleep. Yeah, yeah. So is there something happening where they can put you to sleep or they can wipe your memory and you don't see what happens? I don't know. Which is which is a very valid point. I mean, it could be... Uh... It could be some level of mind control. And if whatever this is can affect someone's perceptions, we don't know how much of the, you know, all we have are the after effects really to go by. Anything else could be altered. Right. Um, it, it's, you've actually made this more mind-boggling with this book. <laughs> Like, it was bad enough in the wilderness, wilderness stuff, but when you, when you connect these to it, it just, I don't know, it, it's so, it, it hurts your brain to try and wrap it around it, because there's just no easy answers here. I was really hoping, Soraya, that we would have this program, and you would be able to solve this for me. <laughs> yeah, I wish. Because <laughs> uh, it, it, it actually, it, it's on my mind a lot, like, you know, I'm always trying to look at it from different perspectives and, and see maybe, you know, what are we missing here that might make this make more sense? Yeah. And I'm sure you're doing the same. Oh, it drives me nuts. Yeah. It drives me nuts when you put this book together and within days after it comes out, people just start sending you cases that you know are right on target and are recent and it's happening right now. Yeah. Um, what are you doing? Are you continuing to, to research these cases or just jet cases in general and see where it leads you? Well, how many spokes to the wheel are there? Yeah. What am I, I mean, when I first started this research, there were the people out there that said, oh, you know what's doing this. You know what's happening. Within the last month, somebody on Facebook said, you know, you're not being right to the victims and the families. You need to say right now what's doing this. I'm thinking, I'm not a magician. Yeah, don't you wish you could? Oh, yeah. And, and then other people said, oh, you're just writing these books to make money, and you could solve this overnight by just telling us what's doing this. I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, if you could tell us what's doing it, it would solve it overnight. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I'd probably be a hero in a lot of people's eyes if I could, but I'm not that smart right now. <laughs> I don't know if it has anything to do with not being smart enough. Like I said, it almost feels like we're only seeing part of the picture. Yep. You know, um, what, what are some of the other explanations that, that people have thrown out there that simply don't work? So I don't know if they work or they don't work, but the other one I get a lot is reptoids. Ah, yes. Um, I've never known what to think of the reptoid thing. I mean, there's clearly a connection to the whole UFO phenomena in general. But the idea of, like, the whole David Icke idea of reptoids seems a little far-fetched to me. Yeah. I mean, we never know. Anything's possible. But if I'm going to weigh down what I think is more or less likely, I'm going to lean against the, the David Icke view that there are reptilian aliens running our government. Then the other one is uh, I get a lot of is little people or fairies. Yeah, well, I I can see it there being a connection there, not being literal fairies, but I you can see in some of the folklore some of the similarities in the stories. Right. Uh, which again says it could be something that's been going on for a very long time. And again. I, I suppose if I could get a room full of experts on fairies and reptoids and aliens and we could have a roundhouse discussion, but is there really an expert out there in those fields? Well, no, because so much of it is speculation. That's the problem. Right. I mean, you can have an expert on folklore. Sure. Um, and you have tons of people who are experts on the UFO phenomena who all may hold completely different viewpoints. Right. 
Right. <laughs> because we don't know. This is this is the problem with any of this stuff is we don't really know. We can we can put together theories. We can we can even support those theories to some degree, but we don't have the absolute proof. We don't we can't prove Bigfoot exists. We can't prove that UFOs are extraterrestrial or extra dimensional or, or any of this stuff. I mean, it, it, it seems to exist in sort of a halfway state between subjective and objective evidence. Yeah. And this may be connected to that somehow, but we don't understand it, so we can't solve it that way. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> So, um, are are there any theories that stand out to you that that seem like they might lead somewhere eventually? You know, the, it goes back so far in time that it shows that we've had many revs of technology development in the last eighty years. So. If they were successful, or whoever was successful 80 years ago at doing this, it doesn't seem like it could be anything related to us as people in the United States that's doing it. Hmm. And maybe it's something observing us. Yeah. Picking these people up to, to test something, who knows what. Yeah. You, you know, I've, I've got a good headache going, so, you're, you know, you're, you're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, again, where can people pick up the new book? Uh, CanAmMissing.com, C-A-N as in Nora, A-M as in Mary, Missing.com. All right. And it's called A Sobering Coincidence. It is not available on Amazon. Well, it is available on Amazon if you want to pay $200, but don't go there because buy, <laughs> right. buy it from my site a lot less. Yes, and, and you sell it for how much? Twenty four ninety five. Okay, so keep that in mind, people, because occasionally people will complain your books cost too much, and twenty four ninety five for this length of book is about right. Well, thank you. And uh, but if you're looking at a hundred bucks for it, yeah, there's that's why they think it's costing them too much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there anything coming up you want to talk about? No, no. Uh, I think uh, the book is, you know, doing well and. The feedback from people like you is really good right now, so all's well. All right. Well, thank you so much, David. Hey, thanks a million, Soraya. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.